Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I'll help you back. I do. Thank you. State, you may proceed. Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Good morning, Ms. Nakhida. Good morning. Um, would you kindly introduce yourself to the court? My name is Juanita Nahera, and I'm, I am the widow of Ramon Nahera Jr. Yes, ma'am. Now, I see that you are, or full name is Juanita. Yes. Do people call you Jane? Yeah, they do. Do you prefer that I call you Ms. You Nahera, call me, Juanita? You can call me Jane. Fair yeah. enough. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Okay, so you told us that you are the wife of the, of the victim in this case, yes. Ramon Nahera. Um, can you kind of tell us, uh, Ms. Nakhera, Jamie, how did you and Mr. Nakhera meet? Uh, we met in 1974, and um, we met at a dance. Um, we, uh, he was... He was there, and we got to uh, dance together. And um, and he told me, um, I've been looking for somebody like you that can dance, that can dance like you. And from that day on, we dated, and we went to a lot of happy occasions, you know. And uh, he just he just loved dancing, and I loved dancing too. So that's something that you loved to do together? Yes, yes, we did. Now you mentioned that it was in the 70s when you first met. When did you uh, and Mr. Nakhida get married? When did what? When were you married? When were we married? Yes, ma'am. It got married in 77, 1977. And were you married throughout that whole time period up until 2020? Yes, until he passed away. So that's something of like 40 odd years? Yeah, 45 at the time of his death. 45 years you were married yeah. to Mr. Nakhira. Yeah. So he was a man that liked dancing. Mm -hmm. What else can you tell us about him? He was a very caring person. Um, he touched the hearts of so many people. He uh, was a loving father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He. He left a little bit of memories, even to the great-grandchildren, uh, even to my, at the time, my little great-granddaughter was only two, two years old, and up to this day, she can go in the living room and look at his picture, and she will burst out crying and asking her mom that she wants her grandpa Raymond back to tell him to come back. And she gets very emotional. Yes, ma'am. What did Mr. Nakhera do for a living? He served in the Air Force. Uh, he joined right out of high school. He joined uh, the buddy system. His best friend was Gilbert Flores, and they joined together. He, he, he graduated from Tech High School. And he belonged to the class of 1960, but he would hang around with the class of 1959. So he would always go to the class reunions. And um, he, loved, he loved the military life, you know. He, it showed him, it showed him so much. He, he felt like everybody should <laughs> join the military so they can show you how to be a good, good person, you know. Uh, approximately how many years Ms. Nakhira did, uh, did Mr. Nakhira serve in the United States Air Force? Served uh, 21 years. And then he retired out of that? He retired. Honorably discharged? Yes, yes, 21 yes, years. After Mr. Nakhira retired, Jamie, uh, did he seek any other employment? He did. He went to work for civil service. And he went to work for civil service, and he worked until 2005 in civil service. The last station was uh, Utah, for Hill Air Force Base. Did you and, and him live in Utah for a time? Yes. Um, we went to Utah because they closed Kelly, and he said um, he wanted to continue his career until retirement. 
So he said, first he said, we're gonna go to Oklahoma. And when we get to Oklahoma, you know, we, we can travel and it's closer so we can come back and see the kids. And then a big tornado hit the base in Oklahoma. And he said, I'm taking my name off the base. You know, I'm not going to Oklahoma. We're gonna go to Utah. And that was the, the best choice, you know? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you stayed in Utah for a time. Uh, I guess moved around a little bit, right? Yes. Because of the you know, military wife, yeah. military family, right? Yeah. Not unusual. Um, when did you guys move back to San Antonio? We got to Utah in 2000 and we stayed until 2005. We were supposed to go for a year, but it was so beautiful. He said, we're going to stay here five years. <laughs> yeah. So around, you said you uh, left Utah in 2005 or got to Utah in 2005? We left Utah in 2005. Utah. Yes, ma'am. And came back to, to San, San Antonio. Antonio. Did you and Mr. Nathan ever reside in San Antonio from 2005 all until the way until his, his death. death? Yeah. Okay. did Mr. Nafeda perform while he was here in San Antonio? Okay, after he retired from civil service, he was a very active person. Uh, so he said he was going to go ahead and, and take a little part-time job on the weekends doing security. And, um, and his mom, <laughs> she's 100 years old, and she's up there, and she told him, you know, if I could go to work at 80 years old, son, you can continue working. <laughs> so he decided he decided to go to work and after retirement and keep working till the age of 81. Now, Janie, I saw you gesturing sort of towards towards behind me, toward the audience. You mentioned uh, uh, Mr. Nafeda's mother. Yeah, she's years old. She's 100 years old. And she, is she present here in the courtroom today? Yes, she is. What is her name? Her name is Genevieve, Genevieve Nahida. So, uh, Ms. Ms. Nahida, the, uh, the elder, uh -huh. will, uh, essentially out outlived her son. She did, she outlived her son. He, um, he always thought he was gonna have at least 20 more years. He kept on saying, you know, mom's up in age. My grandma lived to be 108. He said, maybe I can live to be 100. And, uh, and he was, he turned, he found out he was diabetic when we were in Utah. And, um, and I told him, you know, you need to focus and keep yourself healthy, you know. It's not because you're diabetic. You, you can do it. And I worked in nutrition for 34 years. And I told him, I'm gonna help you. I'm not gonna let you, you know, go bad, you know, your diabetes. And uh, even after he, he had to start dialysis, but he started dialysis way after he retired. And he went to the clinic and, he was very emotional the first time he had to do dialysis. And why is that, Jane? What's, what's that? Why was he emotional? Because it was going to change his life, the life that we had traveling. And he said, our lives are going to change a lot. We're not going to be able to travel like we used to. But I know that deep inside of him, he lived his life for me. He loved me. And I loved him very much. But right after he started dialysis, about a year after, he found out that the people from dialysis told him, hey, Mr. Nagata, you don't have to stop traveling. You, you can still continue traveling. All you have to do is tell us, where do you want to go? We'll call that place and we'll help you arrange your dialysis. And he was so happy, he came home and he said, hey, Rick from dialysis told me we can still travel, Janie. So he, um, he made arrangements to go to Virginia. And he says, we're going to Virginia, we're gonna go visit a friend. 
And um, we were over there for more than a week. And during that week, he got dialysis twice, twice. So he was very excited about that news. Yes. Still yeah, good. it was good news for him, you know. Do you know, Janie, if, if as part of his treatment for dialysis, if he had one of those, uh, some, graft, sometimes patients graft, get those skins, yeah. right? Yes. Did, did he have one of those? Yes, he did. And what arm uh, was it on? It, it was on his left arm. Okay. Now, you mentioned, Janie, that he was still working as a security guard. Oh, yeah, he part worked security, time. yeah. Did he have to wear a uniform as a part of, of that employment? Yeah, he wore his uniform and he was always very proud, you know, to represent whatever company he worked for. And, uh, and he was very particular about his clothes. Um, he wanted his pants to fit perfect. He didn't want them hanging, hanging over. He wanted to look good, you know. And he had a friend that he worked with in one of the places. And that friend, he used to wear the company shirt, and then he would wear whatever pants, and then he would wear boots. And my husband would tell him, why are you dressed like that? You know, you look like you're gonna go and fight the militia. You know, <laughs> you, you don't dress like that for your work. You know, you have to be complete. A very formal man. Yeah, he was Maybe very formal. From the yeah. military training, perhaps. From the military training, yeah. Okay, let's knock it out. Unfortunately, now I have to kind of direct your attention to the events that unfolded on yes. February 24th yeah. of 2023. Can you sort of walk us through uh, how you came to be, why you and Mr. Nakeda were on Depla Street? What okay. led up to that? Yeah. Uh, my husband had been working for a company called Securitas for a long time, for many years, and and then he, um, one of his friends changed to a new company, and he told my husband, "Hey, come work over here at Universal uh, Ally Barton." He said, um, "You really would like it with this company," and he went and had an interview, and they hired him, and. They gave him a bunch of new uniforms, and he was excited. He said, um, I, need, I need my pants to be altered. And, um, and the morning of the 24th, um, we had a beautiful morning. We had breakfast together. He was happy. He was happy, and he said, go ahead and you change Janie, like, quick, you know? Don't take a long time, you know, because we're going to go see the seamstress and um, call call her, you know, and let her know we're going. And I called, but Angie didn't answer. And so, so Ms. Nasser, let's, let's break that down. Okay. So he had a bunch of new uniforms mm -hmm. as a result of his employment, and uh, he was excited to go see a seamstress. Yes. Why did you need to go see the seamstress? Because he had to have his pants altered. You know the his new uniform pants. Yes, ma'am. So she he needed some alterations. He quit. Now he mentioned that he wanted you to call ahead and try to get a hold of of the seamstress. Yeah. Who was that that person? The the seamstress, the seamstress Angie Ramirez. Angie Ramirez. Yeah. And did Angie Ramirez live on Depla Street? She did. She lived on Depla. And that's the connection that you had, essentially. Yes. Together. Yeah. She was. Um, she was a wonderful seamstress. She was. So you and Mr. Nakeda did not live on that. No, we did not. You're we not lived... neighbors of, of anyone on no. that. Well, um, I have family that lives like on the on Darby, which is the next street. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my niece Laura, she lives on oh. on Darby. So then you do have some family that lives in the neighborhood. Yeah. But you personally did not. No, I don't live there. That's right. So I guess that day, what brought you to Depla was the you were seeking out that seamstress, Miss Andrew, mm -hmm. for those alterations. Yes. Before you guys left your house to, to head over to Depla, were you able to to reach Miss uh, Angie to let her know you were coming? No, I I couldn't get her on the phone, but um, Angie's phone she was always having problems with the phone. And, and I told Raymond, I said, she didn't answer. And Raymond said, well, it's okay, because you know her phone's always messed up. 
So let's just go over there. And, and we, we went ahead and took off. And um, when we got there, we parked not right next to the curve, but a little bit away from the curve. Yes, and he, okay. Well, let's sort of break that down. You said you guys drove there. Yeah. Do you remember what vehicle you guys were driving in? Our Camry, our um, 2022 Camry. Okay, so a 2022 a, Toyota Camry. Camry, yeah. And Do you remember a, the color of that vehicle? Yeah, it's sort of like a maroonish uh, or reddish, like an apple reddish or something like that. Okay, and, and who was driving the car? My husband. Okay. Now you say you parked a few feet away from the curb. Yeah. Uh, do you know on, in front of whose house you parked? Angie's. So right Angie's. in front of Miss Angie's house. Yeah. Uh, a little bit away from the driveway. Okay. Yeah. So you were presumably in the passenger seat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Was, I was there in the passenger seat. No, it was just him. And, and myself. So just Mr. Yeah. Ramon Nakia and yourself mm -hmm. in the red Toyota Camry. Yes. Okay. When you arrived and, and the vehicle was parked in front of Miss Angie's house, what did you do next? Um, he asked me, he said, go ahead and get down and um, if Angie's not there, ask him if you can leave the clothes there and you can leave a, a sample of the, the lint and um, I didn't take the clothes with me, but I went through the driveway and I went to the door and I knocked. And um, the his, her grandson entered the door. Angie's grandson. Angie's grandson. Okay. And I, I told him that, um, was Angie there? And he said, no, she's not here. I said, well, I have some clothes. Can I drop it off and, and she can work on it? And he said, yeah, go ahead and get a, get the clothes and I'll give it to her. Was it unusual for uh, you to leave clothes in, in this fashion for Miss Angie to work on? Uh, no, no, because there was other occasions that she wasn't home and we would just leave the clothes there. Uh, how long was uh, Miss Angie a seamstress for you guys? God, for many years. Um, they left Utah in 2005 and I think like 2007 and 2008, somewhere around there, we started going to her. Had you been to Debla on, on many occasions? Oh yeah, many occasions. To give work for Miss Anne? Yeah. The times that you had previously been on Debla Street, do you remember, excuse me, do you remember there being any, uh, any dogs or anything along those lines in the property uh, next door? Well, for a long time, there was a family their names were Medina. They lived there for many, many years. And I don't know when the Morenos moved in there, but um, I, before that, there was no dogs. There was no dogs out there. Okay. So on the occasions you had been there previously, you didn't have any I didn't see, see any dogs. dogs but yeah. that day that I went, the dogs were on the Moreno's property. Yes, ma'am. So let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. And I had just left the front door and I walked. I could hear them barking and they were bark, barking very vicious. They were like, they would go from one side of the fence to the other and they were just like barking terrible. I mean, you know, when I turn around to look at them and barking like that, it, I didn't even think that they would jump over, you know, so. So at that time, were they inside the fence? They were inside their yard. So okay. when I left the front door, I walked to the driveway and by the time I got to the gate, I turned and the, the black dog, he was already climbing the fence with his paws. He climbed so fast that when I turned around, he was already going to the very top of the fence. So I kind of hurried to get to my car to open the door, but my husband was inside the car, but I think he was on the phone, you know, because he used to like breaking news and all that. And he was busy, I guess, with the phone. And I, I got to the door as soon as I could, and I was gonna grab the door to get in the car. 
and the dog just came at me and started grabbing me from my, biting my knee in different places. And I started screaming and I was holding on to the door and I was screaming and I was like, ah, you know, Raymond, Raymond, I said, the dog, the dog. And, and my husband heard me and he panicked, he panicked and he just got out of his side and he came over to my side and he, with his hand, he, his right hand, he told the dog, leave her alone, leave her alone. And the, when he hit him in the head, the dog just let go of my knee and he grabbed his wrist and he knocked him to the ground. So I was, I was, um, the dog like pushed me and I fell down like back and I was between the car and the curb and I was facing up and my husband was on the, against the fence, Angie's fence and the dog was just like pulling on his wrist. He just wouldn't stop. And Raymond was screaming and screaming and he kept on saying, Janie, I can't take him off of, of him. Of, I can't take the dog off of me, Janie. I can and the dog kept on pulling on his wrist. And we were screaming, I was screaming, you know, somebody please help us, somebody please help us. I mean, nobody would come out. And then finally, Angie's grandson came out. He came out with a rake and he hit the dog, like, leave him alone. And he hit him, so the dog turned on him and he knocked him down right in front of his door. And he was on him and, and he was young. He pushed the dog away and he ran inside. Do you know if? And his grandson, when he came out and struck the dog with a rake, do you know if the dog was able to bite Andy? Oh, grandson? yeah, because he knocked him down to the ground, he, and he, he was able to bite him. So, you described for us, Mrs. Nafada, that you saw the black dog climb over the fence. Oh, yeah, he so climbed like a him. ladder, you know, like this, like that. And then you try to get inside the car. Yeah. And then you cry for help. And Mr. Nahira came right out to try to, to save Try to him. help me, and the dog just knocked him down. And at that point, you had already been bitten yeah. on your leg. Yeah, I was, I was on the ground facing up, and I was able to see him. And um, during that time, uh, the dog grabbed my husband, and he started pulling him, pulling him to the corner of the fence and when I saw my husband he looked like lifeless you know I guess he was trying not to put pressure you know not not to pull away from the dog and the dog would pull him forward and he was dragging him at that time Raymond was not saying anything the dog was just dragging him and when the the dog dragged him then the white dog came out of the fence, and the... Let me, let me pause really quickly. Uh, okay. Jamie. You said that the black dog broke off from your husband for a moment when he went after Angie's grandson with the yes. rake. Yes, yes. Did the black dog or the darker colored dog eventually go back to attacking Mr. Nafia? He did. He did. And at some point, you were just mentioning just now that you saw a white dog as well. Yeah, the, the white dog got out of the, the yard. Were you able to see how the white dog got out of the yard? I, I couldn't see that far. I couldn't see, but the, the white dog, after my husband was dragged away from me, I mean, I could still see him, but he was a little further down. The white dog came over to where I was. I saw the white dog walking to where I was. And I went like, this dog is going to finish me up. And she came over to where I was lying down. And I kept on saying, she's going to probably attack me on my face or on my neck. And I started praying. I was praying. I was like, Jesus, cover me with your holy blood. Jesus. You know, this dog is going to attack me. She stood next to me, and I could see her on the corner of my eyes. And the dog just kept...
kept on looking at me and looking at me. And it was just like a miracle. She walked away. The dog walked away and went and attacked my husband. That's the one that pulled a line from him. And, and that's why I was asking you, Janie, earlier about uh, whether or not he had a, a line as a he result did. of that. He diagnosis. had a dialysis line. So you saw, you, you witnessed the white dog <clears throat> attack your husband and, and rip that away from him. No, I, I didn't. But, you know, he was, they moved, the dog moved him more, you know. But, you know, he, that's the dog that pulled his line out. Sure. You mentioned uh, that you were crying out for help, Jake. Did help eventually arrive? They did. The fire department. I I was, you know, I, I had my hands bloody because the dog attacked my hands. And when the dog put his paws on me, when he jumped on me, he ripped tissue from my stomach. And... Um, I was bleeding. I was bleeding all over, you know, from my knee, my hands, and um, I felt, I felt somebody put his, hand, somebody put their hands on me, and they told me, "We're here to help you. We're from the fire department, and we're here to, to help you. We're going to try to put you on the stretcher." And I kept on telling him, "You need to help my husband." I told him, my husband needs help. And he said, we're going to help you, ma'am. We're going to get you up. We're going to get you in the stretcher and put you in the ambulance. And we're going to get to your husband. Uh, <clears throat> Jenny, at some point, did the fire department manage to get you to the ambulance? They did. They did. Do you remember um, if... EMS personnel were there as well, paramedics. Yeah, I think they were. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the uh, EMS treating you, helping you out? Yeah, they put me in the stretcher and they started uh, cutting all my clothes off because they needed to see all the areas that were affected. And uh, they told me they were they were helping my husband. They were helping my husband. Were you able to learn at that time uh, where your husband was being transported, Mr. Nafia? Yeah, they, they told me, we're going to take you to University Hospital, and they're going to take your husband in a different ambulance to University Hospital. Is that where you were transported? Yes. And do you remember, Janie, if while you were at the hospital, someone from uh, San Antonio Police Department came and, and took photographs of you? I don't remember. I was really out of it. Fair, fair enough. But you did tell us you were bitten uh, on your leg? On my knee, all over my right knee, the upper part of my leg, not just the knee. It That's went right. all the way up to the upper part. Right. What, what about on your hands and, and arms? Do you and remember any My hands, he, he bit me right here and on the side. Both hands, both hands. Now, Janie, when you were walking away from the door of Angie's house, mm -hmm. did you show any sign of aggression or hostility towards those dogs? No, I didn't. You know, I just, I just heard them barking, and I didn't really expect to be that the dogs were going to jump, that the dog was going to jump over the fence. I had, that was not even in my mind. I, I didn't even think they were going to attack. Now, uh, Jamie, this is going to be a tough question to ask, but, but I have to ask it. Is that the last time that you saw uh, Ramon Nájera alive? Yeah, that was the last time. When he had, was screaming for help. He was screaming for help. When were you uh, notified, or how did you find out that he had uh, passed away? They were treating me in the emergency room, and they told me that 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 they were going to start me with rabies shots and they said um, we have to put you we have to inject you with rabies shots all the bites all the bites have to be injected 
That's a very painful it, process, isn't yes, it? Yes, he said, all, all the bites in your hands, you know, wherever you got bitten, you have to have rabies shots. So they gave me a bunch of rabies shots, and then they had this orthopedic doctor, he came in, and he told me that, um, that they had to find out if the bites went all the way to the bone, and now we have to inject you with water, and he says it's gonna be quite a bit. We have to get your knee full of water to, I said, where's the water going to come out? And he said, from your wounds. If, if the bite went all the way to the bone, the water will come out through the wounds. And he put the water in there, and it was the most painful, painful thing, you know, because it stayed in there for a while, and my knee got huge. And then they had to take the water out with a syringe and take all that water out. So very painful experience. Very well. painful, very painful. Uh, Mrs. Nafea, Jamie, mm -hmm. how did the events that you witnessed that day, essentially the death of your, of your husband of 40 years, as well as what happened to you, affect you? Has it affected your life? It has affected me a lot. It was this tragedy that it stayed in me up to this day. I cry in the mornings. I cry in the mornings and I grab my pillow. And I said to myself, how could this happen to us, you know? How could this horrible thing happen to somebody that was such a good person? And then there's times when I'm just like, during the day, a quiet time, that it crosses my mind. And sometimes I feel like, what could I have done for him? I was so helpless. Why didn't I try to get up? Why didn't I try to help him? I could have told him, get your other hand and, and get his eyes and pull him out or something, you know? I kept on thinking of things that he could have done to get out of that situation. So, Janie, it sounds a little bit like you might experience what's known as survivor's guilt. It is survivor's guilt. It is. Every day I go through that. Now, Janie, I want to leave you with, with, this, with this final thought, I suppose, from, from this direct examination. Um, were you able to provide some photographs to the DA's office uh, that show Mr. Nakeda as he was in life, uh, and you've seen this before. Yes, there were there were pictures that were sent to because they had come out on TV, so they had pictures of him before. May I approach the witness room? Yes. Miss uh, Nakeda, Jenny, I want to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as page sixty-one through sixty-four. Okay. Would you do me the kindness of taking a look at these photographs and tell me if these are the same photographs that you provided to us depicting yes. Mr. Nakeda? Yeah, yes they are. Yeah. See how he was always so happy with the grandkids? Yes, ma'am. And that was his mom's son. She was 90 years old at this birthday party. Same woman you described yeah, for us earlier. Genevieve, That's dancing, right. dancing with him. Do these photographs fairly and accurately depict what they show? Yes, they do. Your Honor, the state would offer state 61 through 64 into evidence, tendering to opposing counsel for inspection. Sixty-one. 
was taken at, a, at our home. Um, we were going to go, his brother was getting married, and we were going to be the, the witness. And it was a February wedding, so everybody was dressed in red. What about State 62? He was working at the, at the VA hospital. He, um, he would work at the gate so that um, when there was somebody coming in, you know, he would check their ID. That's right. And is this uh, as this part-time security job? Yeah. One of, one of the um, jobs that he had, because he, he moved with several companies, but he was always security. Yes, ma'am. And this is the, the sort of uniform that you described yeah. for us. Right? Yeah. The kind of pants that he would have taken. Yes. <laughs> what about State 63? This was the 4th of July parade at Leon Valley. And he was, a, he was the one that would move everybody. He was like, he would tell the kids, we're going to the 4th of July parade. You guys get ready, you know. And he would always take the kids to different, different uh, events. And then finally, State 64, Janie, you told us that Mr. Nath had a love to dance. Yeah, he did. What are we seeing on State 64? He's dancing with his mom. <laughs> He always had to dance with his mom, the first dance with his mom, since he was the oldest. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Janie. I have no further questions. Okay. Janie, if I may, I may call you Janie. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I represent Mr. Christian Moreno. Mm -hmm. I'm going to inconvenience you a bit and ask you to step, if you could move your chair a little bit to your left. To the left. Just so I have to be able to. We don't have this. Hi, I'm sorry. At your convenience. Okay. That's fine. <clears throat> Let me begin, uh, Jamie, uh, by expressing my sincerest, sincerest, deepest condolences for the loss of your husband. I also want to express how sorry I am that you had to suffer, that you both had to suffer physical, mental, and emotional damage and harm. Um, as you know, my client, a co-defendant in this case, Christian Moreno, has pled guilty in this case. Yes. He has accepted that he was negligent in the manner in which he kept his dogs. That has happened already. I would like to inquire a bit about very recent events involving a lawsuit that was filed on Friday. You're familiar with that lawsuit? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. You are represented by attorneys in a civil action? Yes. And the attorneys, with your consent and on your behalf, filed a lawsuit in federal court? Yes, they did. Now, it's my understanding that in this lawsuit you are alleging, with the assistance of your lawyers, that the city of San Antonio committed several different wrongs in the manner in which they dealt with these dogs. They did. In they general did. terms, they failed to follow the proper procedures and other errors in ensuring that these dogs were not let out to the general public once they had custody of the dogs. They should have never been returned. Never. Is it fair to say that you find some fault in how the city of San Antonio and its agencies handled this without getting too specific into the case. Yes. Is it fair to say that you have taken the position, Jane, that you would like to stop this from happening again? Yeah, I made that statement that 
I wanted to stop. I, I don't want nobody to have to go through what I've gone through. Do you hope that this lawsuit could help that happen? That's what I'm looking for, you know. If the city does what it's supposed to do, that these kinds of things don't happen again. You're hoping that that yes. will come about as a result of the lawsuit. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. No questions, sir. May she be excused? Yes, Your Honor, on behalf. Yes, I can get up.